So good to see you today, church. Glad to have our online crowd with us. We are glad you are here. Whether it is your hundredth time with us, your first time with us, you are welcome here. You belong here. Whether you are a faithful person or pulling for the 49ers today, we are glad that you are here. So glad that you're here. I'm fired up today already. I'm, I'm fired up. I tell you what, let me for the parents, if for any kid in your car on the way home ever asks, why does your preacher, why does Mr. Mitch sometimes not sing during the songs, and why does he just lift his hands up? That is because the lump in my throat is so big that I can't. God is moving in the life of this church. And so sometimes, whether just doing this when you can't sing, you just do this. And I am just blessed, as I know you are, to be a part of seeing what God is doing in this place. Brothers and sisters, as we get into the Word of God today, please be turning to 2 Samuel 9. 2 Samuel 9, we continue part two of where we picked up last week in the life of Mephibosheth. So I encourage you, if you're like, boy, I missed that part one, go back and listen to that. That's not about me. That's about the Word of God being preached to this broken earthen vessel. Go back on our website, listen to that. And part two this week, we're talking about as a church being inviting to belonging. We just don't want to invite people. We want them to have community here and be a part here. As you're turning to 2 Samuel 9, let me say something pretty provocative. And before you head for the doors, give me a second to explain. God is not all you need. That would be one, if I, you caught me on the wrong day, I'd head for the doors. Because you bet, Mitch, God is all I need. Why don't you make your case for that one? Adam is living in a perfect environment in the book of Genesis exalted status, unhindered access to God. Sin has not yet entered the discussion. Perfect environment, exalted status, unhindered access, and God comes down and says, not good. Something's missing. Community, belonging. God says that God is not all you need. God has placed us in his community. And so today we want to continue that discussion of what it is in the life of Mephibosheth to understand belonging. We read this story last week, but I always believe the reading of God's Word, even at length, is good for the church. And so let me do that now, 2 Samuel 9 and 1. David, in this soliloquy, asks himself, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And, and notice the language here. The king said to him, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? His has said love. And Ziba answered, the king. Well, there is still this Jonathan. He's lame in both feet. He's helpless. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, well, he's, he's down in Lodabar. He's at Makir's house. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Makir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied, fear not. There's no need to be afraid. David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'm going to restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. I've got a place here for you. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant? What, what is this that you should notice a, a dead dog like me? Notice what David doesn't do. Now, let's talk about that term dead dog. That's accurately uh, something you've called yourself because you have nothing that uh, could benefit me. No, no, David doesn't do any on that dead dog business. It's as if he didn't even say it. it mm, we're not even going to tolerate that here. The king summoned Ziba, saw a steward and said to him, I've given your masters 
grandson, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him, bring him crops, bring him land, so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Naziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, so they got after it. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth from that day forward ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. He's not second class, he's, he's one of his sons. Mephibosheth had a son named Micah and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. And just so you get it clear that he didn't deserve any of it and didn't qualify for it, he was lame in both feet. Last week we talked about the purpose-filled way that David lives his life in this instance, in this story. David wasn't always perfect, but in this story, man, he's having his best day. He's living a covenant, purpose-filled way. And in so doing, one morning he asked himself, who can I show God's kindness to? In effect, we talked about last week, how can I act like God today? Because that's what God does for me. How can I act for God today? Because that's what God does for others. Let me give you this morning four mindsets, four understandings we have as a church that allow us, that prompt us, that inspire us to show God's kindness to others. Now, if you've got that handout, I want you to get to the back of that handout. There's a sermon outline. If you have anything to make notes with today, I want you to make notes today. Because if you are a part of this church and belong to this church, I am unpacking what God's Word says it means to be a part of this local body of believers. These are the understandings we have from Scripture, and specifically this story, of what it means to be a member of this place we call the park. And I'm ready to give it to you, and I hope you're ready. So I want you to lean to the person on your right and your left right now and say, I'm ready. Go ahead. I'm ready. All right, now that you're ready, we can get underway. Number one, we understand that we are only here by grace. That's what we understand at this church. Like Mephibosheth, he is a foreshadowing of us. We have qualified in no way under our own power and deeds to be here. We are here only because the son of David invited us into his table. Amen, church? That's why we're here. Two times it says of Mephibosheth, he was helpless. He had no business being there. He didn't get there on his own. He says of himself, I wasn't a dog, which in that culture is not like what we keep in our homes, a a pet, a family member. A dog back then is something to be discarded, to be avoided. Mephibosheth doesn't say I'm a dog. He says I'm a dead dog. I'm worse than that, which is to be avoided and discarded. Who am I? The church, let me say this, to Understand that we're a Mephibosheth character that don't deserve to be here is is a good understanding in the Scripture. It is to get at the heart of one of the points of who we are. But to focus on Mephibosheth is to miss the main point, to miss the real point, the real person, and the real question involved here. How does David one morning wake up and say, How do I show his kindness? See, it's one thing to be a Mephibosheth and receive it. How do you wake up one morning and say, how do I give it? And the way that you give it is you have a mindset like David, we talked about this last week, that is prompted by covenant, by promise. This was not an emotion for David. This was not a feeling for David. This was not David waking up on the right side of the bed morning, David. It was, I made a promise and a covenant that I would show God's kindness, and now I'm doing that. But right about now, somebody really wanted to drill down and say, Mitch, I've made that promise in my life, and sometimes I don't keep it. Sometimes I've made that promise to be a God-kindness-showing person to others, and sometimes I'm selfish. How do I understand a piece of information in the Word where I begin to live that out? 2 Samuel 7, so we back up a little bit, two chapters. What does David have going for him that allows him to keep that covenant of love? 
Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, man, God, you're lucky I'm here. Woo, I'm a bag of chips and all that. Woo, you finally chose the right one. David went in and he said, who am I? Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if that was not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, not just what you're doing for me currently, you've also spoken about my future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere person. You see, David is able to give to Mephibosheth because David understands himself as a Mephibosheth. I'm a dead dog. Oh, that was just David one moment in his life. He really didn't think that way all the time. Well, then don't go to Psalm 8 if you think that. Because though Don won't sing sometimes, David will sing. And David in Psalm 8 begins to sing and teach Israel to sing, Who am I? Who is man that you are mindful of him? And he tells Israel and the community of faith, This is what we sing here. And church, this is what we sing here. We understand that we are only here by His grace. In the same way, we have been shown God's kindness. We now show it to others. And right about now, somebody's missing the point. So Mitch, what you want me to do is really focus on how low I am. That's a, that's a stop to the ultimate destination, but if you stop there, that's not it. I understand how low I am because of my sin. The ultimate stop is not I understand how low I am. It is I understand how loved I am. That's it. It's not earthworm theology. It's exalted theology. Like Mephibosheth, we've been granted a seat at the table as sons and daughters of the king. It's unbelievable. That's gospel. The second thing we understand here as a church is we understand life can make us, make others, make people fearful. What Mephibosheth must have thought when he was going to see David. It's over. I'm done. I'm dead. I know what happens to people who used to be a part of the former realm of the king. He shows up, David's first statement. Fear not. Don't be afraid. We understand today life can make us people anxious. It can make us hopeless. Life can be downright frightening. Whether it's health issues, financial issues, raising kids, taking care of parents. Wait for this next year. I wonder if any politician will play on fears. I was with a 93-year-old aunt yesterday in, um, just outside Paris, Texas, Honey Grove, Texas. Edna, how you doing? I'm so fearful, Mitch. And Edna, why are you fearful? The border's open. Vote, be concerned, do something about it. But if you're 93, living in Honey Grove, Texas, don't let your last days, I'm so fearful. Man, life, the TV can speak to you about, be afraid. And we understand life can make us afraid. We understand, let me take it up a notch, that even the community of faith can make you afraid. Somebody says the community of faith can make you afraid? Let a guest who is a single mom with three kids walk in this building for the first time. Well, I'm not afraid to be here. You're right, you're not afraid to be here. You've been here for decades. You've been here for months. You know the routine. You know the language. She's running 15 minutes late because Junior just threw up all over himself. And she's thought about twice turning the car around. But she showed up at our building and she saw the biggest building on the end was where we must have worship. And so she pulled up at the children's building and walked in and there was no one there. And then she went around and she saw the one that wasn't a flat roof and looked a little bit like a church building. And she went in there and there was no one there. Surely this church doesn't meet in the gym. Yeah, we meet in the gym. And then she walked in here 20 minutes late and she's looking for a seat. And Junior just threw up again. 
And you know what? Even being in the community of faith can sometimes... Y'all feeling me on this church? It can make you anxious. It can make you fearful. You can be a guest. You can be a member. You can be here for the first time in 50 years and it's your spouse passing. You walk in alone and you're fearful. You're anxious. Back to Scripture. Mephibosheth had four uncles, dad and a granddad. The Philistines kill granddad Saul, dad Jonathan, three uncles, and one uncle lives, Ishboseth. This family had a big thing with naming people Seth at the end. Ishbosheth lives. In the turmoil of the transition between Saul's kingdom and David's kingdom, it looks like Ishboseth, Meshiba, Mephibosheth's uh, uncle is going to be king for a moment. And he doesn't make it. Well, the Philistines must have got him too. The community of faith got him. The community of faith got him. Other Israelites got him. In fact, two men that were charged with protecting him got him. It wasn't the enemies. It was his friends that got him. Sometimes it's not just a guest who doesn't know the building. Sometimes actually in a place this big, people can be fearful coming in the doors because they've been hurt by the church. Can you identify with that one? They've been hurt by the church. Mitch, how does that happen? Because none of us are graduates of grace yet. We're all still works in project process. We're sinners. And so what do we do with single moms with three kids who show up 15 minutes late? And what do we do with Mephibosheths who go, well, the community of faith killed my uncle, and now I've got a little bit of fear there in going to see David, but I'm going to see him. What do we do? We as a community of faith are committed to loving people when they walk in these doors and walk into our lives like it's going out of style. Amen, church? That's what we do. We want to say to anyone who comes here, don't be afraid. We're looking for opportunities to make people feel at home. My cousin's oldest got married a few months back in Phoenix. Cindy, what time is Craig's wedding? Well, it's late on a Saturday night. Mitch, we'd like for you to be there and participate. Great, I'll be there. There's no way I'm making it back for church on Sunday. I can't fly back, and so we'll stay over. I'll take a Sunday off, and on Sunday morning, I want to go attend this, let me talk about Church of Christ history, this Stone Campbell Restoration Movement Church, and hear about what they're doing and see what they're doing with my own eyes. So I go attend this church that started 39 years ago in a guy's house with 12 people. They're now at 17 campuses, and I I walk up by myself And it's a large campus, about the size of ours. And I don't know anybody. And I want to video it, so I feel kind of funny doing that. So you'll notice some real poor video work, about 45 seconds here. And here's me walking into a church I've never been to before, my video. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. I'm trying to learn a few things here. Wonderful. Well, I'm Joshua. Joshua, I'm Mitch. I'm Lost. Mitch, nice to meet <laughs> you. What are we looking for? Church? Yep, trying to get to the assembly. You're not looking for the uh, nursery or anything? No, no, no. Don't have those today. All right. Well, I can show you exactly where it is. Okay. Is I didn't mean to say what I said. I walked up and I just said, hey, can I, how can I help you? I said... My name's Mitch, and I'm lost. And he said, my name's Joshua. And the video, why I went ahead and turned it off was, it was him leaving his guest services purchased at Sam Tent, and he walked me all the way to my seat and sat me down, waited for me. You say, Mitch, you told this story about another church a few months back. It's another story, different church. Waited for me to get done with his wife, said, how did it go? How are you doing? 
Something there spiritual about a guy saying, I'm lost, and a guy named Joshua, name meaning God delivers you, <laughs> delivering you to your seat. Church, I'm going to get real with this. Can I get real and not just talk way up here? We need a church that is willing not to greet people at the doors, but greet them in the parking lot. And when they walk up and they say, I'm lost. And they don't mean it geographically. They say, I'm lost. We can say, we want to be Joshua. We want to not only deliver you to a seat where you belong, we want to deliver you to a table of Jesus Christ where you belong. Amen, church? Well, Mitch, if we do that, I'm going to have to start showing up 15 minutes early. Mitch, if we do that, I'm not going to be real comfortable around here. Mitch, if we do that, that's a burden I'm going to have to bear. It's going to be as if I'm, I'm bearing a cross. Well, Mitch, if I do that, it's going to be I'm giving up my place and my life. And I tell you the truth, whoever gives up their life will find their life. And I thought I called you to carry your cross. And church, let me tell you, showing up 15 minutes early on a Sunday, that ain't carrying your cross yet. But it's a step in the direction of being uncomfortable so someone else can be comfortable. And so it's why we have a safe place to doubt. Where people walk in these doors and they go, this is odd for me. I'm about to sing songs to a God that I'm not even sure I believe in. But we want to talk to you about doubting and how that leads to faith. It's why Lori Varnell is leading an empowered class that we can't get a big enough room for. Where women who have been abused and hurt come. It's why on Wednesday nights you can sign up right now for grief share or divorce care. It's why in the season to come, we're going to be doing things to our physical building here so that when people pull into the parking lot, there's signage in places where visitors, where guests park, and people come and are made to belong and feel at home. Well, how does all that happen? How does David do that? Remember back to Scripture? What was David? We talked about this last week. And I highlighted it moments ago. The king... The king, the king, it's all the king, the king, the king said go, the king thought, the king. And then when Mephibosheth shows up, king language is gone. David said to Mephibosheth. Number three, we understand God wants us to be humble servants. David takes off his crown. You'd be greatly mistaken if you said here, I can't tell who the servant is. Is it David or Mephibosheth? You know, you'd be greatly mistaken if you thought that it was one or the other. It's very clear. The servant is David. Mephibosheth is doing nothing. He's bowing down trying to save his life. He's saying, at your service, but it's David doing all the serving. I wish that we could find a story in the New Testament that looked this good. You can. I'm tired of feeding these pigs. I'm tired of longing to eat what they want. I think I'll go home. Oh, man, here comes Dad running. Oh, man. Uh, He really must be mad at me. I'm dead. I'm dead. He's running. He's so mad. Hugs him. Oh, Dad, I'm, I'm a dead dog. I'm a dead dog. Just like David. No more of that. Bring his future. Bring the food. Bring my sandals. Servants, now my boy is home. Place at the table. The story of Mephibosheth is the story of the prodigal son. It's our story where a king doesn't listen to your excuses of why you don't belong. And it is in that humbling servant in which God serves us that we now serve others. We lay down our power structures We lay down our titles. We lay down our comfort so others can be comfortable. Not just here on Sundays, but in our entire lives. Every day, every Sunday, I choose to be uncomfortable so others can be comfortable. And so David shows kindness to Mephibosheth, and that's the end of the story. That's the end of their story. Or, 
does a son of David named Absalom start a coup against his own father? And as David is fleeing, he sees Ziba and he says, Whoo, man, we better get out of here. Absalom is right on our tail. That son of mine, whoa, man, not good, not good. Hey, Ziba, have you seen my adopted son Mephibosheth? Ziba, the servant. Yeah, I have seen uh, Mephibosheth. He's back in Jerusalem at your palace, hoping that this is the day Saul's reign returns, i.e., you ain't going to be king, and that one you showed grace to, he's ready to be king. David must have gone, hmm, talk about a stab in the back. David gets back to Jerusalem. Hey, Mephibosheth, what do you think you've been doing? Mephibosheth, well, uh, let me tell you the truth. Zeba here, when I wanted to go with you, my two lame feet didn't put me on a horse, so I couldn't go. So it's Zeba's fault. And David goes, this is what he doesn't do. Well, let's call a court and get to the bottom of this and pray about it. And one of you two is about to be in big trouble. That's what David doesn't do. Why doesn't David do that? Because David made a promise I'm going to extend grace. David made a promise, much like a God who extended it to him, that even when I'm messy, the promise stands. And I want to show God's kindness. And so we understand this, number four, church. We understand it will be messy. And in the messy, we're still ready to extend grace because that's what God did for us. Amen, church? It's going to be messy. It's going to be tough. There's going to be people walk through these doors and into our lives that don't look like us and don't act like us and they're not acting right. Just like us when God came to us and said, you get a seat at the table because of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be tough as nails sometimes. But like Charlie Mahaffey said, we're going to err on the side of mercy. Well, that won't always be compatible with me, Mitch. We're not talking about compatible anymore. We live in the light of covenant. I'm not always going to prefer that, Mitch. We don't live in the light of preference anymore. We live in the light of promise. I'm not always going to like what we're talking about doing here. We're not talking about like anymore. We're talking about living in the light of love, his love. And so compatibility gives way to covenant, preference to promise, like to love. Last thing I want to share with you today is our commitment that we're all going to make. We're committed to belonging. And before we talk about extending, let me get down to brass tacks here, extending community to anybody else. If you're with an earshot of my voice and you have not yet said, I want to be a part of this community, we want you to make that step today and invite you to do that. I want you to do today what the preacher that is preaching to you has never done. Bad preacher. You know what I've never done? I've never placed membership at a church. I've never done it. I've been at three churches in my life. The first one, somehow, after I got baptized, I just was a member. I didn't, didn't sign any piece of paper. They just did that. I was 12 and didn't understand that. I went to college. A church hired me to be an intern. Guess what? I was a member the next day. The elders at this church in 1990 hired me. And somehow, when you get hired, the elders kind of like the minister on staff to also be a member. It just happened. So today, after service, I will be walking to Next Steps and placing membership at this church. (laughs) I'm going to do it. (laughs) Some of y'all are going, it's about time. (laughs) We've known there's something wrong with you. (laughs) Join me. God wants you to be a part of the Big C Church, his body. But he also wants you to be a part of a local community of believers where they know your name and you know their name. Number two, we want you to be a part of a smaller group at this church. Mitch, what's that mean? We don't want you just to be on the roll. We want you to be in a class. We want you to be in a small group if you're not in a class where there's more give and take. 
We want you today, if you're a, a guest here, to fill out a Connect card. They're in the back on the communion tables. Let us know you're here if you're a guest. We, just, we actually want to send you a tin of cookies if you're a first-time guest. I want to write you a note to say thank you for coming our way. On the back of the sermon outline, there's a little QR code. Hit that and you can do it in, in the digital world. And most importantly, if you're like Mephibosheth, we want you to belong, this is it, number one, to Jesus Christ today. Mephibosheth. Let me play out the story how it didn't go. David, I really appreciate the new fields, the old fields that were actually mine. You're giving back the crops, the servants, the title like one of your sons, the place at your table. I'm out. I'm out. And David said, servants, chain him down at my table and force him to eat. I don't see David doing that. At some level, Mephibosheth had to say, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll accept this gift of grace. Galatians 3 and 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children. Well, wait, whoa, how did we all begin to belong to each other? You're all children of God through faith. That faith for all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. So there's no part of going this way in Christ where it doesn't also go this way. We're all children. We're family now. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one belonging in Christ Jesus. If you have not done what Chuck has done today, Christopher Chandler or Locke, we ask and encourage you to take that invitation. Church, let's stand at this time. Let's sing at this time to our Lord God.